So Control Yourself asks, I do a bit of discussing Christ with people of other faiths and, and atheists. However, I do get stuck when slavery is brought up against me. My question is, why is the term slavery used in the Old Testament when we know that they were actually employees regarding the Jews with their quote-unquote slaves? Yeah, and this is a, a, a very, very important question. And so I'm so glad that our, our brother Control Yourself asked this because I hear people all the time, especially people who are, are atheists, people who are not Christians and want to attack Christianity, attack the Judeo-Christian God. They use slavery as one of their case in points. And they say, open shut case, God was for slavery. How could God have loved before that? Uh, therefore, I am going to reject your God and... Uh, you know, and reject any argument than you say in the rest of the book because Bible is self-contradictory, totally messed up God. I want nothing with them. And I do want to equip you and everybody else with the right argument or what I believe is the right argument to deal with this and, and the right way of understanding the Bible. And if the truth was that really what the Bible's talking about is just a mere servant or like an employee, I would be all for that and say, yes, that's right. That is the correct answer to give people. Um, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that, and it's not quite accurate. There was, an in, and indeed the Bible is speaking of at times, true slavery. It was a thing, and we have to understand why was it there? Why did God allow it to persist? And the truth is, when we acknowledge that there was slavery, it was ongoing, and God was putting up with it at a time, we can better appreciate actually the love of God and, and just how patient and forbearing He truly is. And I think a good, a good starting point is what we were just talking about earlier, where someone had asked, is Satan the enemy of everybody? And the answer is, yes, he is the enemy. And we have to understand that we're dealing with a world where Satan has corrupted things so horribly. Things are so different from God's original plan. And if God was just to instantly show up today and say, hey, you guys need to get 100% with my program perfectly today, now, or else you're in trouble, we're all doomed. We're all doomed. God is a dictator. God, uh, we're all going to fail horribly. And it's going to be extremely disappointing and, and it just wouldn't work. And to give you an example, think of it in terms of parenting styles. So if you encountered a parent who has a two-year-old two child and then proceeds to parent this two-year-old as if that child was an 18-year-old, you might think these parents have something really wrong with them. And I'll give you an example, right? Let's say... Uh, the father comes, sits down, looks the two-year-old in the, the eyes very lovingly and says, uh, you know what, Jack, uh, your, your mom and I, we were speaking and we decided that really you're, you're just so troublesome. We can't control you. You're just really resisting what we're trying to do. We're trying to watch out for your best interest, but we can't control you. So um, we feel like time has come where we need to just actually let you go experience the real world. You're going to have to go out on your own, realize the consequences of your actions. So we're going to let you go out. Uh, maybe in six months, you're welcome back, but you need to go out into the world yourself and, and try to make a survive that way. If you did that with a two-year-old, everybody's just going to be shocked. How dare you do that? That's terrible. We say, but what? But it works with 18-year-olds. You know, there's there's a certain point where we have to use prudence and realize you can't treat everybody the same and you have to meet people where they're at and grow them and then take them to the next level. And this is critical to understanding why did God permit slavery? Why is it there, especially in like the laws of Moses? Why is it there? Why did God permit it? Why didn't he just totally ban it? like we see more in the New Testament time where it's all about setting the captives free and, you know, a bit more societal change in, in that direction. Though even still, the book of Philemon, as we mentioned last week, is all about Paul returning a slave to the master. So let's 
dive a little bit into first the the words that we're talking about. So we have the word ebed. Ebed. This is the word for worker. It it basically comes from the the verb to work. But we never use the term worker. You're probably not going to see that in the Bible worker. Usually it's translated either like servant or slave. And as you know, right, servant and slave has a, a bit different connotations to it. But but Ibed kind of at its core is like our word worker, our English word worker, where it could apply to employees, it could apply to independent contractors, and it could apply to even slaves. Technically, they're all types of workers. So the word like like worker, Ibed, these words don't tell you much about the relationship other than that somebody is working for somebody else. So it can apply to all types of different worker relationships or arrangements. And so we don't know when we're talking about someone who's an Ibed, if we're talking about someone who's voluntarily working for somebody else or if it's somebody under slavery. So this word Ibed is used by Abraham when God shows up and Abra Abraham says, I am your Ibed or I am your your servant, God. I am willfully, willingly wanting to serve you and work for you. And then when God or the angels show up to Lot in Sodom, he again uses that word to convey how he serves them. He's their servant. But he's not saying, right, that he's their slave involuntarily. Uh, we have a similar word that deals with female slaves, female workers, maids of that type. There's a couple of words, actually. There's shifcha, a maid, maid servant, slave girl, and then ama, a maid servant, female slave, maid. Why there's two words, I, I don't know, but they, they're both used in ex, starting even in Genesis. Or actually, I shouldn't say necessarily Genesis. You see one for sure in Genesis, like when we're talking of, oh yeah, no, they're both in Genesis. And I believe both are used, to, in fact, to refer to Hagar. So if you look at Genesis 16, verse 1, it says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant, a shifcha, whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, or Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid, my shifcha. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Does this sound sort of like a, a normal just employee type relationship between Hagar and Sarai? Yeah, where basically Hagar is, or Sarai say, hey, Hagar, you're my, you're my shifcha, go sleep with my husband. Like that's that's not exactly something that you normally see in a, a pure employment relationship. And this is what we have. So really, we're seeing that Hagar was kind of almost at the level of like property, being treated like property. She's owned by Sarai and Sarai uh, gives her to Abraham and Abraham takes her. Uh, um, this is uncomfortable language. Now, it's in the Bible not to affirm this and say this is good. It's in the Bible specifically to show us just how it's bad, to show us the problems of this sort of thing. And, and there's actually a remarkable amount of tension given to Hagar and her struggle and how she gets kicked out and her crying. And then God shows up for her. God shows up for the handmaiden, for the slave woman, however what we want to portray her, for the shifcha. Because God does care. God never intended for a situation like this to happen where one person is completely at the mercy and control of somebody else uh, and then even gets abandoned when not really doing much wrong. I mean, she got a little bit proud. Uh, ultimately, she now realized, oh, maybe I'm better than Sarai. Sarai. And then um, her son was also picking on uh, Isaac after Sarah, Sarai gave birth to him. So there was some level that she ended up getting kicked out. It was her fault. But this still doesn't totally justify it. You have a multi-spouse now home, and it doesn't work. And you look at every single instance in the Bible, polygamy never turns out good in it. Not once. 
always a mess of family, lots of hardship. So again, like some people might say, oh, well, polygamy is in the Bible. It looks seems to work great. Maybe we should do it too. Whereas the Bible is trying to tell us, no, it doesn't work. It's not good. We have to look under, under the surface, see what's really going on. And it's the same thing with slavery. It's there. It's not telling us it's a good thing. It's, in fact, against God's normal plan of making humans equal to each other. We see from the very beginning, God made Adam and Eve, and he took Eve out of Adam's side. You know, so they, were, they have a parallel equal relationship from the beginning. And it was only after sin that then God said in Exodus 3 that, hey, Eve, guess what? Now your relationship with your husband is going to be a bit different and your desire is going to be for your husband and he will rule over you. This is now the beginning of now damaged relationships where, yeah, people are over others in a very authoritarian way as opposed to a love-based, um, service-oriented, voluntary type arrangement. Uh, let's look at now Ebed and, the, you know, this is the male servant word used with regard to the children of Israel in their time of slavery. Exodus 5, 15 to 18, and then we'll look at verses 20 to 21. And it reads, Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why are you dealing with us, your servants, your Ebeds? There is no straw given to your servants. They say to us, make bricks. So like they're being forced to make bricks. And indeed, your servants, the Abed, are beaten. But the fault is in your own people. So they're Abeds. They're calling themselves Abeds. But is this voluntary? Are they able to leave at any time? Are they able to do what they want? The answer is no. They're being, this is forced labor. This fits probably most anybody's definition of what slavery is. It says, yeah, they're beaten. And the fault is your own people, they're saying uh, to Pharaoh. But he said, you are idle, idle. Therefore, you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore, go now and work for no straw shall be given you, yet you shall deliver the quota of the bricks. So he said a very tough quota. If not, you guys are going to get beat. That's that's not no like slavery. Yeah, sounds like slavery. Then as they came out from this is verse 20. Then as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said to them. Let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the eyes of Pharaoh in the sight of his servants, the Abeds, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Right? So violence is coming upon them because of tough demands. They're not meeting those. Satan's getting, or <laughs> Satan, well, yeah, Satan technically, and then indirectly through Pharaoh, is bringing tough pain and control and uh, oppression onto them. So this is clear-cut sign where Ebed is not talking about a voluntary voluntary relationship like we might think of employment, but truly slavery. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind too that God put in rules and laws in his commandments not to preserve slavery, but rather to protect the slaves. People talk about how radical the law of Moses is because it it took steps and measures to protect people who normally never had protection. It elevated women, even though not as much as we would have liked to seen by modern standards. It elevated slaves. It elevated uh, orphans, all these people, the, the poor, in, in ways which no other society around them would have had these sorts of laws. And I wish I could just do like side by side. I'm not that sort of scholar, but other scholars who have done this have commented on just how liberal, how radical these laws given to Moses were for their day. So here God is being progressive, but God is also not trying to go way beyond what these people could handle for that time. And Tina, did you have a comment, something you wanted to Mentioned. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now I was just thinking, you know, when you're talking about the Obed of the, you know, Israelites during that time, the, they were slaves in Egypt. That's what they were delivered from. Like God delivered them out of that kind of that's slavery. Right. 
You know what and I mean? It, that was not God's will to the point where he sent 10 plagues to get them out. So, you know, God is a deliverer. God is not an enslaver. So anyways, that was just my only thought on that. Uh, that was a big point that we overlooked at. <laughs> so I'm glad you brought it up. So yeah, God here then slaves him. He liberates those slaves. And he, he makes a big point about that, right? And he says, don't forget that. Remember where you came from when you treat other people. Uh, so great point there. Now let's look at Exodus 21, starting at verse 26. So this is some of these laws, these commands, instructions on treatment of people. And, and God says, if a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant, Ebed, and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let them go free for the sake of his tooth. So God is very intentional about trying to put in protections for these people He's saying these are still valuable people and and don't think that their lives are invaluable that they're just mere property that you could just kill or abuse and there's no consequences with it so yeah there's some other verses where you know you could do some things to slaves and it's not in a world or whatever and it for them uh, or the, the the abusive master but still there's these protections it's still way more progressive than his day it's like god parenting a two-year-old as a two-year-old two-year-old needs to be parented remember as, as tina just mentioned right these were just slaves a few days earlier they just came out of egypt they they have a slave mindset a slave master mindset and it's going to take time for them to get out of it but as we come further into the the Closer to the New Testament, we have, for example, Isaiah talking about the calling of the Messiah. What's his purpose going to be? I think that's Isaiah 58. Um, break every yoke. Yeah, Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is this not the fast I have chosen? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the press go free, and that you break every yoke. Mm -hmm. So God's calling out Jews, right? You think, oh, you're, you're great fasters and you're very religious people because you starve yourselves for a day. Good for you. But God says, like, that's not what I care about. I really care about, right? He goes like, yeah, I'm doing the heavy burdens, loosening the bonds of wickedness, letting the press go free and breaking every yoke. God doesn't want to see any slaves, doesn't want to see anybody burdened down. And his message is all about freedom. As Jesus says, he that the you know, sun sets free shall be free indeed. This is God's attitude. God, I, I, it's just so beautiful. So this is where we as Christians, if we do properly accept the Old Testament for what it is, which is showing us the brokenness of humanity and God's efforts to slowly inch us towards a better way, that we then comes to greater fulfillment, fulfillment and revelation in the New Testament, then we have a, a God who makes a lot of sense, a God who's very reasonable, a God who's very patient, and a God who's showing us what really love looks like. Love is not impatient. Love doesn't just come in and say, you instantly got to change and instantly get perfect and better right away or else you're going to get punished. No, it's a God who just slowly but gradually and continually keeps working on us to get us better and better and better and more in his image so that's uh i believe is the truth about slavery in the new testament or sorry old testament and how it connects even with the new testament and how we can have a, a more informed conversation with uh atheists the the skeptics and those who uh haven't really spent the time in the bible they need to get the full context so thank you again brother for asking that great question and then tina any any other comments thoughts you'd like to share on this yeah, I um, there's a beautiful point that um, somebody once brought up as far as, you know, just as as far as, you know, the value of human, human life, basically, and that, you know, the people say, oh, the God of the Old Testament was so different. And really, he wasn't. But I, I appreciate how you're saying that, you know, God was, you know, trying to bring about change in his people who had just come from, you know, the slavery mentality. Um, and he starts with these laws and, you know, to bring rights back to people who, you know, were less fortunate and had ended up being like, you know, bondsmen or, 
you know, slave or, slaves, even if it was temporar- temporarily, temporarily, um, because some people would you know be a slave or a servant to work off a debt, and so it was a different you know form. It was a different type of you know um, government back then, and so. But there was one thing that stood out to me when I looked at these laws and somebody had and brought it up in Exodus chapter 21, um, you know, like in all these laws, it talks about, you know, um, you are not allowed to steal. And if you do, like you pay back, you know, what you stole. However, except for in the case, there was never the death penalty for stealing, except for in the case of stealing a person. And mm-hmm. you see that in Exodus chapter 21, verse 16, and he says, he who kidnaps a man and sells him like as a slave, or if he is found in his hand, so you have enslaved him, he shall surely be put to death. So God's punishment for enslaving people, like true enslavement, was death. God did not permit that. That was not okay with God by any means at all. At any point in time, God does never said you can enslave somebody as far as, you know, they have no rights, you know, they can never be free, you know, they're just property. Never. God never, ever you know, had that in action. And in another thing is too, you know, a lot of these people who are servants or, you know, um, in the government of Israel, after they'd come out of, of, um, out of Egypt, out of, you know, that type of slavery, that, that true slavery that we think of, you know, when somebody has no rights and they're just beaten and forced into doing whatever their master tells them, um, you know, God talks about, you know, being a servant until the year of Jubilee. And at, mm-hmm. at that point in time, they, those people are allowed to go free. That's a good and point. so there was, yeah. And there was always a point in time where God said, okay, if somebody wants to serve you, you know, to pay off debt to, you know, whatever it is, because, you know, they owe, owe you something and they, they don't have means to pay for it. They have to, 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 to work. Cause that's the only thing they have to offer. You know, they can only do that until the year of Jubilee and then they have to go free. And so, um, unless they choose to save, you know, unless that person chooses to stay working for you and they had a choice in that matter. And so, um, you know, God's system was very, very different. Um, even though, yeah, it wasn't totally like, you know, they weren't an employee <laughs> per se exactly in the government system. Like you're saying, it's, it's not totally that way either. Um, it's kind of this, you know, different, it was a different, it was just a different time, a different mentality, but at the same time, you know, God's will was never to enslave and control the the life of another person as if they weren't a human being as if they were a piece of property that's not god's character mm-hmm. you know we're all created in the image of god male mm-hmm. and female that's what god says at the beginning and that's who he is and so Amen. how can you treat somebody as if they're not uh, when god clearly says at the beginning that we are all created in his image so we all you know are capable of having and reflecting god's character so mm-hmm. anyways um, I don't know, there's something I'm super, super passionate about <laughs> just because um, it's something that, you know, I, I grew up studying and um, as far as, you know, the slavery that happened in our country and how, you know, some people said, oh, these are Christian people that promoted this and nobody can be a Christian. Nobody can take the name of Christ and enslave another human being. You can't, those are completely in contradiction yeah. because God is a God of love, not mm-hmm. a God of force. So God of freedom, and- not a God of bondage. Mm-hmm. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody who Absolutely. believes that otherwise definitely does not go, does not know the true God. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Because yeah, how can you, <laughs> how can you treat somebody, you know, less than a human being uh, who is a human being? Like you just yeah. can't do that. So I'm, I'm just so grateful because we, we have a God who loves us so much. And I think too, I, I appreciate you bringing up the point of the story of Philemon, who was a, a slave or servant who had um, escaped. And there's a really cool verse too um, mm. in that book where he says, you know, and to the master, like, accept him back to you, but as a brother and not as a slave. And that's literally like the the words that he puts in and it's, and that's so true is that, you know, it's not only that when you accept somebody back, it's like, okay, I guess you're like a human, but it's like, he's a brother. You should be treating everybody, even people that are considered, you know, slaves or lesser as brethren, as your own family, because we're all part of God's, you know, family of humanity and we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So, Oh, I like that. Yeah. Let's look at that. Philemon one verse, starting at verse 
let's say 15. Paul says, for perhaps he departed for a while for, his, for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. And then verse 16, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. No, I yeah, love that. I, I really like that because that. That, that takes out some of the tension that some people might think were, oh, did Paul affirm slavery and and all for it? But yeah, reality is God doesn't want us to necessarily be violent overthrowers of the current legal way of doing the law and and government, yeah. Government and economy. Well, we're no anarchists. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is something that troubles me even a bit with modern Christians where we think we have mm -hmm. a righteous cause and we might be right. We could be totally right on, you know, the government is wrong and doing something that is maybe even dangerous. But then we proceed to then act in a way that's very unbecoming of God's people mm -hmm. and and almost does more to harm our cause and, and, and bring disgrace on God rather than handing it in a handling it all in a more mature way that brings about maybe change over a slower course of time, but mm -hmm. it's still more effective in the long term. Amen. And, and you saw that, you know, in the life of, you know, people like Martin Luther King Jr., who he had, you know, nonviolent, nonviolent protesting, uh, where he was, I mean, he, to me, exemplified Christ in so many ways of how he was just like, we're going to you know, protest, but we are not going to use force. We are not going to, you know, do any physical harm. We are going to do this with, you know, tact and, and bravery and with the love of Christ. And I mean, such a beautiful demonstration of, of, of what it means to say, okay, we want to bring about change in, you know, against, you know, something that's wrong, but in, in the right way. Mm -hmm. And so, and you see the opposite, you know, of, um, of that happening today sadly you know there's a lot of people using violence to try to counteract violence and all you get is more violence mm -hmm. and you know we need to bring about change in a loving christ-like way which yeah it, it might take longer but it's going to be more effective you know in the long run and i think about you know what where i was recently um watching videos of the life of christ and there were um there were you know these Pharisees who are having a discussion about Jesus and they were talking about back in Jesus's time that there were rebels is Israeli rebels against the Roman Empire because the Romans had you know conquered Israel and they would they were not quite enslaved <laughs> but they were definitely oppressive to the Israelites um, as far as the Roman government now did Jesus say let's take over the Roman government no not at all you know when um you know they came to arrest Christ you know Peter cuts off the ear of one of the, the guards and Jesus says, that is not my kingdom. That's not how I do things. That's not my way. And he heals the man. And it's only by love that, you know, is love awakened. And, and that's the manner in which Christ wants us to bring about reform and change in, you know, in our world today. Mm -hmm. So and we definitely, I appreciate that, that point you made, because it's so true um, that we can't just, mm -hmm. You know, do this huge upheaval that's you know mm -hmm. the world you know we have to do things in a in a proper and an orderly way in a peaceful manner so amen all right